Welcome to my channel, I'm Scott. And in this video, I am going to walk you through the process of valuing MDU resources stock by analyzing their financial statements and dissecting their financial ratios so we can determine if it's a buy or a sell. MDU resources supplies products and services through its energy and utilities construction businesses. The company is headquartered in Bismarck, North Dakota and was founded in 1924. It went public in 1948 and currently trades on the New York Stock Exchange and Frankfurt Stock Exchange. The company operates in 48 of the 50 U.S. states. MDU got its start in 1924 as the Minnesota Northern Power Company, where it was selling electric power. Let's get started with the model. This is a mid-cap company, 6.7 billion market cap. They're trading at $33 a share and they have 201 million shares outstanding. Let's look at the financials. The way you value a company is you estimate the free cash flows into the future and then you discount those numbers back to today's value. That's what we're doing in this video. And free cash flow is cash flow from operations minus capital expenditures. They had positive free cash flow in 2017 and 2020, negative in 2018 and 19. Net income is the profit and loss on the income statement. It's revenue minus expenses. That's pretty steady from 280 million up to 390 million. Revenue is a sales for the company and that grows a little bit each year from 4.4 billion to 5.5 billion. This is the company's income statement. The top line is the revenue, the sales. Below that is the cost of revenue. These are the expenses directly related to generating the revenue. And the difference is the gross profit. Their gross profit was the highest in 2020 at over $1 billion. Below that is operating expenses. Examples are marketing and depreciation. Gross profit minus operating expenses gives you your operating income, which was also the highest in 2020. Below that is the interest they pay in their debt, which was 96 million in 2020, a little lower than 2019 of 99 million. Then there's other income and expenses. And the bottom line of the income statement is their net income, which was the highest in 2020 at 390 million. This is the company's statement of cash flows. The top line is operating cash flow. That's how much cash the company generates from its operational business. You could think of operating cash flow as net income converted to cash because net income is your accounting profit and loss. It's not actual cash. And you can see that operating cash flow is going up a lot each year from 440 million to 770 million. Then you have capital expenditures, which are investments in property, plant and equipment. Operating cash flow minus CapEx gives you your free cash flow. They had negative free cash flow in 2018 and 19 because their CapEx was greater than their operating cash flow. Companies use free cash flow to pay a dividend, which they do, to buy back stock. They bought back 17 million in 2017 and 5 million in 2018 and also to pay down debt. But they're not really paying down debt. In 2017, they paid down $70 million of debt but in 2018, 19, and 20, they issue more debt than they pay off. Let's look at the capital structure. 3.1 billion of equity, 2.4 billion of debt. They're 56% equity, 44% debt. And their WAC is 6.7%, and that's a discount rate we're gonna apply to the future cash flows. We estimated four years of future free cash flows. We also estimated a terminal value, which is all cash flows past year four, that's 9 billion. We discount those numbers back to today using the weighted average cost of capital. We get a value of the company of $7.9 billion. We divide that by 201 million shares. And we get a calculated stock price of $39. They're trading at $33, so they're trading at a 15% discount. It's a buy according to the model. Simply, Wall Street is way higher than me. They're at $137 a share. They're saying the stock is really undervalued. Four analysts priced this stock and the average price was $34. The low was $29, the high was $40. This is a stock price the last five years, so you can see it was pretty flat for a while, then took a big dip in March of last year, then it's been going up ever since. So if you got it at the dip, you could have made a really nice return. It's trading at its all-time high currently. This company seems to raise their dividend periodically. They went from $0.19 cents up to $0.21. Cents. They pay a 2.55% dividend yield. And the way you calculate the dividend yield, you can multiply the last dividend payment by four, take that number, and divide by the stock price. They pay out 44% of their net income and 81% of their free cash flow. 
The top 25% of the market pays a 3.5% dividend yield. They're at 2.5%, so they're a little lower than that. Their industry pays a 3.2% dividend, so their industry is higher than them. Analysts are forecasting their dividend to grow to 2.6% in the next three years. This article really explains an aspect I think about when I value a company. It's written really concisely. I'll just read it to you. Howard Marks put it nicely when he said that rather than worrying about share price volatility, the possibility of permanent loss is the risk I worry about and every practical investor I know worries about. It's only natural to consider a company's balance sheet when you examine how risky it is, since debt is often involved when a business collapses. You cannot just say debt is good or debt is bad. You have to look beneath the curtain. When is debt dangerous? Debt assists a business until the business has trouble paying it off, either with new capital or with free cash flow. Part of capitalism is the process where failed businesses are liquidated by their bankers. A more common scenario is that a company has to raise new equity at a low price, thus diluting shareholders. Of course, debt can be an important tool in businesses, especially in capital heavy businesses. When we examine debt levels, we have to consider both cash and debt together. So think of it real simply. If you take on debt at 3% and you invest that cash back into your company and you generate 6%, that's good debt. But if you invest that debt into your company and you get a 2% return, that's bad debt. These are the kind of things you have to look at when a company is constantly taking on new debt. Is it producing more money than the company spending on the interest on the debt? They have a pretty low beta, 0.73, so the stock is not volatile. The stock has gone up 45% in the past 52 weeks, while the S&P 500 went up by the same amount. The 52-week low is 19, the high was 34. The stock is trading above its 50-day and 200-day moving average. About 1 million shares are traded each day on this stock. Of the 201 million shares outstanding, 198 million are on float. 72% of the shares are held by institutions and 1% of the shares are shorted. If you include dividends in the past year, this stock has gone up 55% while its industry 16% and the market 58%. In the past three years, this stock has done worse than its industry and the market. But in the past five years, this stock has outperformed its industry, but underperformed the market. Analysts are forecasting their earnings to grow 7%, its industry 10%, and the market 17%. The revenue forecast is for this company to grow 5%, its industry 3%, and the market 10%. In the past five years, their annual earnings grew 13%, its industry grew 8%, and the market grew 12%. In the last year, they grew 17%, its industry 12%, and the market 7%. If you invested $10,000 into this company 10 years ago, you'd have about $19,000 today. That's about a 6.8% annual return. The biggest shareholders Vanguard at 10%, then BlackRock, State Street, LSV, and FMR. Let's look at their financial ratios. The average PE in the market is 33, the median is 22, PE is stock price over earnings per share. To calculate earnings per share, that's net income over shares outstanding. They're at 17.2, so investors are paying $17 for $1 of earnings. That's a good PE ratio. Price to sales is 1.2, which is better than the median and average. Price to book is 2.2, which is also better than the median and average. Price to book is stock price over book value per share. And the way you calculate book value per share, it's equity over shares outstanding. Equity is assets minus liabilities on the balance sheet, and they have three billion of equity, 2.3 billion of tangible equity, since they have 740 million of intangible assets on their balance sheet. Their return on invested capital is 8%. Their interest coverage ratio is 5.6. This is a big indicator when you think of debt. What's their interest coverage ratio? How many times can they cover their interest payments? If it's below two, that's a big concern. Their ROE is 13%, which is better than the median and average. Current ratio is 1.4, so they can cover their current liabilities with their current assets. And their current assets are mainly receivables of 900 million and inventory of 300 million. So the company does seem to be well capitalized. They had $210 million of free cash flow, $374 million of working capital, and they pay a $171 million dividend payment. They have over $400 million of funding. So to summarize, I have them trading at a 15% discount. 
This company has been around a really long time. They seem to be growing, their revenue is going up each year, and they pay a nice little dividend also. I rank their free cash flow 7 out of 10, their revenue 8 out of 10, and their ratios 8 out of 10. So let me know what you think. Give this video a like, subscribe, or comment below. Also, if you'd like to get a custom valuation or just support the channel, you can become a member by clicking on the link in the description below. Thanks for watching.